again But it's the only way you're ever gonna learn You look back and it's all in the past I'm dwelling on the thoughts I cannot say to you If I don't say the words that maybe it's not In fact, it's not the professionals, it's the unprofessionals this morning. Mitch texting us and asking us where the link was. I think uh, too many pints in the strawberry last night, Mitch. <laughs> I just had one of those senior moments. And a conspiracy theorist as well, you hear? Oh, great. It was great. It was a fantastic night last night. It was, good. It was, it was funny. You cannot be a conspiracy theorist in this day and age. Yeah, you get fined 4.2 million, as we've seen on the news. So uh, probably best he keeps those kind of thoughts to himself. Uh, welcome along to uh, episode one of The Professionals. And um, I think it's uh, it's only right that uh, me and Mitch and, and Stu get together once a week. So we're going to be doing it on a Sunday night moving forward at six o'clock, uh, where we'll be looking back at the weekend's games and events. Uh, obviously, we will have to move and change uh, shows around because um, from our perspective, some of us will be at the game, some of us will have other things going on. But Sunday night's going to be the regular slot. That doesn't mean we're losing Ben Jacobs. Ben will still be chipping in uh, as and when he can throughout the season. Things get busier for Ben as the season goes on. But uh, delighted to, to have this new show on the platform and looking forward to having a bit of banter with the lads. 45 minutes we'll do this morning. Uh, obviously, a little bit different this week because we're looking at uh, the season ahead. And where where you know the guys think we're going to finish, uh, and of course having a, a quick recap on uh, where we think we're going to uh, finish in the league, what we're going to do in the cups, and what Newcastle United are going to do today, and how excited the lads, I guess, are about being at St James's today. So let's start with that, Mitch. Um, you're back in the UK, uh, back in the Strawberry last night, and you're going to be in and around uh, the area for the next couple of days. How excited are you going into this season? Because let's face it, the last fourteen years, Mitch. Um, under Ashley were awful. We went in. We went into each season with no hope. Um, we would be trudging up to the ground, even on a sunny day like this, and we would be, you know, we would be sick as a chip before a ball had been kicked. How are you feeling today? Well, it, it, I've tried to play it reasonably cool so far, but then last night when I met Steve, we uh, went into the hot spur and then we walked up to the strawberry from the hot spur and just seeing the ground got us going. It was like, yeah, now I'm excited. Now I'm home. Seeing the sunset over the top of the the, the the shadow of the stands, you know. Um, yeah, now I'm excited. Hence why I couldn't find the link this morning, because I was excitable. Um, and forgot you'd sent us it last night, you know. So it, it, it is, um, for all I'll try and play it cool, I'm not inside, I'm like a burn again. I'm really looking forward to it. And I have to say, it's the first time I've said that going into a season for what feels like a hell of a long time. You same question to you, mate. You're back in the UK. Looking forward to catching up with you guys later on. Um, what's what does it feel like just being back here? You got your you got your new shirt on, and you know, probably shirt to one of the things that people watching we just didn't buy because we didn't want to finance right, exactly. Ashley. We didn't want to put anything in. It's, it it feels like a rebirth. No, it is. I, I wouldn't buy a shirt under Ashley, but uh, and I, I didn't want to get the white and green one because it's too much like a hips away shirt. So I've already got the black and white one, so I had to get the blue one, as you can see. So I put it on for the show, but I'll be taking it off when we'll go out on the drink before the game. Uh, I had a bit of pretty, pretty much warm-up last night. Uh, finished about one o'clock, and I've been up since five o'clock, all kiddie excited, waiting for the game. I, I like to come for the first game of the season because I've even, even back in the day, I always, always used to love the first game of the season, whether it was home or away. Uh, more often than not, we got very disappointed. You know, <laughs> we'd been at Millwall, uh, Millwall at home, and stuff like that. I'm thinking back, but uh, today it feels totally different. Uh, it, it feels like a rebirth of a club. There's hope. With that comes expectation, I suppose. But there's there's a genuine togetherness of the fans going at, going into the ground, and and I, I can't wait. And when I mean, as, as you all know, I'll go to see Mitch Wrigley in Dubai. And I said, we'll have to do the first game of the season. We've got to do it. Uh, and we've managed to pull everything together and change <laughs> holidays and flights and everything. And, and, we, and we got here. So uh, we had a meal together with his dad on Thursday, which was really nice. Uh, and he was out last night, but I was already out. I went up to Scotland to see family yesterday and then come back down. And I was 
in roundabout Gosforth from about seven o'clock until last order as well, after last orders, obviously. So I'm actually feeling better than I thought I would, but I think it is the excitement of, of going to the, the match again. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I can't wait. And I don't expect to be disappointed today. Uh, I know we have been in the past on the first day, but this is going to be a big season for us. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, the question, I guess, from most people in the chat is, uh, first of all, where did you go last night? Well, we know Mitch was in the Strawberry Stew. Where were you? Uh, Gosford uh, Street? Most of it, no, most of that was in the Jubilee in Cox Lodge. Uh, Jubilee, just Cox along Lodge. from Ford Metro Station or from Wandsbeck. Uh, my brother lives around there, so it was, it was closer to go there. Uh, the heat come across, and then we mates up from who used to go at the way matches with us. He's travelled up from Pool and Dorset. In fact, he's sitting over there. So <laughs> he's waiting for us to finish his show so I can get <laughs> Who's got, there. Who's got the, the biggest list. hangover? Uh, Mitch, I reckon. Yeah, well, I'd say that it might be me because Mitch is still drunk by the looks of his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I had oh, that shirt on yesterday, strange enough, Mitch. So uh, the people might be looking and thinking, did you borrow it off us? Because I had it on last night. Paul oh. Oxley says uh, the noon badge makes you look like a bouncer. Uh, they're called oh, dog technicians these days, not bouncers. I'll, I'll sit that way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, look, Newcastle um, go into the season full of optimism. We've established that, Mitch. Um, what would be a successful season for Newcastle United this year? I'll stick with what I said at the end of last season. To have a season where we're not looking over our shoulder at the relegation zone and we're finishing the top 10 and we'll look like we really mean business in the Cups and give them a go. That would do me for this season. Because what Howe managed to do was phenomenal to drag with the finishing position that he did from where he took over. Something that I think will not be repeated for a long time. You know, proper record-breaking stuff we witnessed last season. So we've got to temper that a little bit, you know. But there's no reason why we kind of go and mix it with everybody because we showed last season, with one or two notable exceptions, that we can mix it with just about anybody. And that's today is the perfect situation to start the season. At home, full house, Newly promoted team who've got 10 gazillion signings to try and squeeze into their starting lineup. Um, we've got a really big opportunity to make a statement today, and I'd love to see we do that. That said, I would take a 1 0 win with the ball going in off the back end of Dan Burns' arse if, if it made men three points to start the season. It's, it's about getting the three points more than anything else today. Um, but yeah, for a season goal, top 10, never have to worry about relegation through the season. And look like we mean business in the cups. Stu, same question well, to you. What would be a successful season for Newcastle United this year? Well, as you both know, I'm a bit of an eternal optimist and always try to look at the bright side. So I wouldn't say the glass off or rather than empty because I'd rather have the glass drunk. So, but uh, the way I, I see things with with Newcastle is the, there is no ceiling to what we can achieve here, uh, and it's. They've, they've been doing everything the right way. They've been doing everything quietly and professionally. And, and for a change, I just, I'd just i like them to go, wow, and just give us a big sign or two and say, right, this is our statement now. Uh, if you go back to me, I'd add statement about building the skyscraper. The foundations are in place. I think that's what he was meaning to say. Uh, and then we will reach for the sky. But you've got to have solid foundations if you're going to build anything. And, and we've got that. And we've got that in really reason for quick time uh, with the director of football and good to see anyhow anyhow get a new contract because he deserves it. Uh, he deserves it for the we steadied the ship and brought the team on. The unity in the team, I think that's what carried it for the last uh, few few months of the season. But he's I'm sure he's not naive enough to think, well that's job done. You know, that's stage one complete, but this is not going to finish at stage one. I believe the owners want us to be winning the Champions League by the time 2030 comes because it's a special time for uh, Saudi Arabia. It's their 100th anniversary and, and it's all part of the 2030 vision where more than half of their income, their GDP, is not going to be oil expectant. So that this is this is something that they'll be pushing for and it's, it's, it's just a case of how quick do they want to do it and are they willing to advise it, uh, take advice or are they wanting it to go faster. But my prediction for the year, I really think 
I, I still say this, and I, and I like the way the other teams have started to spend because they've panicked, because they thought Newcastle were going to do it. The way Arsenal, Tottenham, they've all borrowed money. Chelsea, you know, they're all throwing money at players. Just, uh, but we're building a squad, and we're, we're getting the right fits. These are your square pegs for square holes. We're not just saying oh, he's available, so we'll buy him. He's available, so we'll buy him. We're, we're getting a team that will grow, and and as I've said repeatedly. Anyone that they bring in will be better than what we've got. So that means we are improving. Uh, we can get frustrated, but really we shouldn't with how we, how much we've, we've done in the first, uh, first what, 10 months of the, of the ownership. And if you look back at the last two seasons, if we're all honest, we, we're probably expecting relegation with the, the mood of the, the city, the... The sound bites that were coming from the manager at the time, you know, it was never his fault. It was always someone else's. The players were rubbish, and it wasn't a good place uh, to be. It wasn't a good time to be a Newcastle supporter. And now we are, we're going this with genuine optimism. So I, I still think we could finish fifth, and that's that's probably the maximum we can get this season, and probably the, the season after as well. But realistically, I, I think we should be challenging for seventh or eighth. Because uh, I'm, I'm sure we haven't finished buying yet, and if we're frustrated as fans about new signings, don't you think that <laughs> the the board or don't you think the manager is? You know, so it's, they'll get it. But and I'm glad they're not just going to throw money at people just for the sake of it. You know, it, it, that's not what we want to do. You know, we've seen other clubs do it, but yes, there is a need to improve it. But they will get the right players, and I've got every faith they will. Before yeah, the season, yeah, yeah. The I agree, mate. Andrew Malloy uh, asks us a question. If anyone else has got one, stick them in the chat. We're always happy to divert and uh, listen to what you guys have got to say. Andrew says, uh, who do you think will take the third place in midfield after Joe and Bruno? And who will the centre-back pairing be, Andrew? Uh, we did talk about this last night, but we don't mind recapping. From my perspective, 100%, I think it'll be Sean Longstaff, who will be in the middle with uh, Joe and Bruno. And... Um, I haven't really changed my mind, uh, despite Steve Hastie's team last night, where a lot of people seem to think Lascelles will play uh, tonight, uh, today with Burn. Um, but yeah, I, I still feel that he, he'll go with the two centre halves, Botman and Burn. But it's 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 a it's a million dollar question. We'll chuck in the keeper as well, Andrew. I still think he'll play Debravka. I know people, you know, Mitch said no place for sentimentality when when me and Keith Patterson gave our uh, teams last night, but. Um, it's going to be interesting. Two o'clock kind of come quick enough, never mind three, right. just to see exactly what Eddie Howe's going to mind. Mitch, what's your answer to the questions Andrew's put? Well, in my team last night, I had obviously Pope and Cole. Uh, my centre-back pairing, I think, was Cher and uh, Botman. And uh, Willick would be my third man in midfield. Mm -hmm. OK, Stu, your thoughts on it again? Well, I, I said that I think he'll pick Pope. I don't think he's bought him not to play him. And it's not as if he's bought him with games played. They've had a pre-season together and they've, you know, I've been working behind the scenes. But I wouldn't be disappointed with De Bravka at all in the slightest. If you remember, I put him as my best keeper for Newcastle when we did the, the Dream Team. That's because I had to get someone from each decade. But um, Midfield, I think you'll play Sean Longstaff if we look at uh, the last home game in the league, which I mentioned on Wednesday night, was the Arsenal game. And uh, the way Longstaff dovetailed fantastically well with Bruno, uh, they seem to complement each other well. And without Shelby in the team, uh, it looks like uh, Sean can excel again. Uh, so for today, I, I think you'll have Longstaff in the middle, but I wouldn't be disappointed if it was Willock. Um, I think you'll have in centre-half. I believe it will be Shaw and Botman. Again, for the same reasons, you don't spend 30 odd, 40 million on, on a player and not play them, uh, especially when they've had like, the last uh, six weeks together. So Botman will play. And and using the phrase that Mitch mentioned last night, which I watched about 5.30 this morning, was sentiments uh, has to go out the window. Dan Byrne has done exceptionally well for us. Uh, and if he wasn't a local lad, would there still be a club for to be in the team? Uh, I think the answer to that would be no. He was bought because we couldn't get Botman at the time and he was brought as a replacement, as a stopgap. Uh, and he's proved to be superb in what he's done. And if he has to be a replacement and come on, we're not going to be, you know, you normally in the past we've had a start in 11 and that's it. He's, he's incredible strength and depth. I believe for the last 
three or four months of the season last year when whenever Lascelles played, I thought he was exceptional. It seems that he's he's been able to focus and uh, he's been revitalised. Uh, he looked fitter. He looked more comfortable with the ball. So again, I wouldn't be disappointed if, if he played at all. And the one thing I'm happy about is it's not my decision. It's Eddie Howe's and whatever he goes with, I think we should give him the full backing. But personally, I think you'll do Lascelles. I'm sorry, uh, Shaw and Botman, and it'll be Sean Longstaff and ahead of Willick and Midfield. Hey, give me Eddie Howe's wages and I'll do the job. Um, <laughs> 100%. Uh, Emmett asks, uh, as we know, J7 loves a tackle. Do we think he'll pick up a yellow today? Yes or no, Mitch? He's a player who's always like, likely to. Um, I don't think he will, though. I think he'll, he'll, he, he, he's, he's better when he focuses the energy into his own game in other ways, for me. And I think that's the fine line he walks is when that energy overspills into, uh, you know, exuberance and top tackles. That's when he gets himself into bookings. But uh, I don't don't see why he should today. OK, Stu? He shouldn't, but it becomes part of his game now. You know, like I, I referred to him as Robocop the other day, didn't I? And yeah. the way he's, he's marching around the pitch and don't pick on him. He's, and it, it's great that he's got that about him. Uh, and I think he's he's reveling in it. But he will have to be careful he doesn't get a reputation that the referees decide to give him an easy yellow or the other teams think they can antagonise him to get him booked and then he has to be really careful with the, uh, you know, well being sent off. So in a way, I was glad he got sent off in pre-season because it might just uh, curb his exuberance, shall we say, and get him to refocus on what he is good at. And that is winning tackles. It is holding on the ball. It is setting up play. And the fact that he is more of a forward player, he, he can see a pass better. So, uh, will he get booked today? Probably. <laughs> After all that, probably will get booked. Tune Tipster last night gave us the odds. It was 10 to 3 yesterday um, for him to get booked. So, uh, well, if you fancy doing that, I think that's the food bank bet that he's putting on as well. So, uh, yeah, fantastic. BT, thanks for this. Uh, it was a quote from Eddie Howe. He says, if I sat, there, uh, sat here and said... I didn't want to win a trophy. There'd be something wrong with me in my position. That's my dream, to win silverware and to achieve great things for this football club. So, uh, here, here, let's hope that that is uh, something which he can achieve over the next few seasons. Jordy Toot Life asks, lads, West Ham have done fantastic uh, the past two seasons. But for me, as we stand, I think player for player, we are just as good, if not better. So, why not finish sixth this season? What are your thoughts, Mitch? Well... How many points did we throw away from winning positions in the opening part of the season? Was it twenty-four? Mm-hmm. Um, let's let's not be greedy. Let's have just over a third of them. Let's say add ten points on where we were at the end of last season, and that should tell you how possible it is. If you wanted to, you know, extrapolate that form across the entire season, I'm probably being. Um, you know, uh, easy saying. Let's let's have just over a third of those points. We probably should have had a lot more. So, it's possible, and and I tell you what's making it possible, and it's something I picked up when a few people have said in the chat. There, isn't it great to have all these options, and yeah. not just to have the options, is you could put a logical argument together for just about any player to include them in the eleven. It's not just oh, you know. Steve Bruce's big random wheel of, of fortune of who's playing where today. This is, you know, well, you could, you could have a logical argument for all four of those centre backs to play it today. You've got a logical argument for about five midfielders to go into the centre midfield. You know, there's there's, a, there's only a handful of places which are sort of like wrapped up and nailed on. And that's fantastic to have that flexibility. And that's the kind of thing you need. That's the depth you need if you want to sustain a challenge and, and move up to that next level and go towards the top six. Stu, your thoughts on West Ham and Newcastle? Uh, how do they compare? I think they're in that little group, aren't they, that Newcastle um, want to be in this season, I think. Well, we're more than capable of being in that group. And if if we take the form from the turn of the year, then we're sure that we are capable of it as well. But we can't rely on nine game unbeaten runs every every season with that the same set of players, you know. So this is why we have to be adding to it and bring more quality to make it more sustainable. But uh, I don't go with the argument player for player we're better than them because 
it's not individuals that win the game, is it? It's the team, and that's what we've got. We've got a huge team ethic, because if you look individually, you'd see a Man United player for player would be better than us. But uh, I do think we can finish above them this season, uh, and I genuinely do think that. So, uh, can we finish sixth? Well, yeah, because I, I predicted fifth uh, is, is, this, is the ceiling for where we could be. So, if, if you say the top four is nailed on, Arsenal seem to have bought well, but the, those tend to winter badly, you know, when the pitches aren't as nice or the weather gets a bit colder and stuff like that, they get. And to me, they're always one result away from a disaster because they've, they've probably got the most over-expecting fans in the league that they also have. And, you know, they, they got comfortable, too comfortable with Wenger. It was 17 years consecutively in the Champions League and they're hounding them out. And I think they've been in it once since. So... Can we finish six? Yeah. Uh, can we finish above West Ham? Absolutely, we can. Um, it, it, I think with the two shrewd additions, and I'd love to get a, a hold of midfielder which would take out the conundrum of who plays as it will it or long stuff. And we've got someone like Tielemans in because we know his premier quality. We'll get him at a decent price because of his contract situation. Um, and I think him and Bruno together there could be magnificent. And, and I just think if we're trying to buy sensibly and, and get him quality, and he's got a World Cup coming up and he wants to be playing, he's not going to get too much game time at Leicester with the way things are with him. So someone like that in the midfield, that I think he'd be worth at least another five or six points. So taking it to Mitch's argument there, at five or six points to where we were, we finished. That puts us in the top eight anyway, didn't it, last season? Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's without a 14 game head start. So. I think it's yeah. I think it's sensible what they've done that you know they haven't gone out and um, you know brought in huge marquee signings. We've still got plenty of time to bring it forward in. I get what Barry Hogan's saying in the chat about being disappointed about um, you know not having a forward in yet. Thought would have had one in before now, but look, it's still open. The transfer window is still open, and like you know the names that keep getting bandied around um, the three the three midfielders at Leicester: Barnes, Tielemans, Madison. If we get one of them, it improves the squad and. Uh, Remember that, man. This is a long-term project. It's not a short-term fix. It's a long-term project. And, you know, we will get where we need to be. It might take a little bit of time. But like we keep saying on this show, enjoy the ride. And I know the demographic of people who watch this show are predominantly over 40. And, you know, I think we all get it. I think some of us get a bit excited at times. And why not? That's what it's all about. But um, I think most of us have got our feet on the ground because most of us have been through horrendous, horrendous owners, relegated up and down, you know, like a... Um, you, you know, like a concert here that's been ridiculous really over the over the last 14 years. We've had no hope. So just enjoy it. That's that's the best thing. Just just enjoy it. Uh okay, we've got we got quite a few questions backed up here. So John says, would Fraser be better than Miggy in terms of end product, Mitch? In terms of in the premiership last season, that would have yet to have been the case. In terms of what we've seen in pre-season, no, he's not. So th there's two players fighting for a place. And, and again, there's there's a you, you've got a strong argument as it stands today. If you said, right, I'm putting Fraser on the right, I can understand why. I'm putting Miggy on the right, I can understand why. And these are wonderful problems to have. Yeah. It's it's just wonderful to be able to say, I can put a logical argument forward for this team and turn around and have three of us probably pick slightly different 11s and have a very strong argument as to why you've picked the 11 you've picked. Um, these are really good problems to have. And um, from the preseason, it seems like Eddie's keen to give Miggy a run. So let's see. Yeah. What's your views on that, Stu? That's something I uh, referred to just before there. That it's, it's great that we have these problems, or Eddie Howe has these problems. They're nice ones to have. <laughs> and I think if we're going forward and looking at the next stage of our evolution... Both people like Ryan Fraser and uh, Miggy Alvaron will be squad players. They won't be starting players. Uh, so at the moment, there's there's a huge case for Miggy the way he's done. Ryan Fraser prefers to play on the left, which opens up another kind of worms. Would you play him on the left, especially for away games, because of his ability to track back and and he, he can see a pass, will play a pass going forward uh, and keep uh, ASM for the home games when we'll have more of the ball. So. There's, there's plenty of options there, but I don't think we'd be too disappointed if we got a big... Uh, someone's ringing the phone there. Got the, Is it a bad phone? You just went red there as well. 
No, I think it was the lace. <laughs> I didn't it's breathe when I was it's joking there, man. It's Commissioner Gordon. It's Commissioner Gordon. Now, the uh, guys, Commissioner Gordon on the phone. The, <laughs> the, what was I talking about, Fraser? So, if, if, we get, if we get a new right winger, or even a new left winger, because the people that we've been, and something I mentioned, I'm sure it was on Wednesday, that we've been linked with, they predominantly been left wingers, haven't they? Or left-sided players. Like the Harrisons, the, the Barneses, and... Uh, See now the alcohol is kicking. I can't remember all the names, but there was about four top names that were all left-sided players. Uh, so, is the smoke without fire? So, maybe it's not. So, uh, I'm not trying to kick up, uh, kick the hornet's nest about ASM again. But the, I, I think long term, is he going to be part of us? I, I'm not sure. But the I original thought, question Adam already did that on Thursday. Didn't even have a yeah. squad. Yeah. Really? So I'd, I'd let Malcolm. Malcolm carries a bit more kudos with Newcastle than that, too, considering he's playing exploits. To be fair to him, like, uh, and he knows where the goal is a lot more. Not, well, not as much as I know where the bar is, I suppose, but he knows where the goal is. Yeah. The, he stopped. He stopped, uh, he stopped uh, for want of a better phrase, he stopped bashing the wood, Malcolm. He started bashing the ASM on Thursday. <laughs> I, I, I see this. I, I watched it yesterday morning. It's, uh, I talked to Malcolm if you, a fair play to him if he still wants to bash wood when he's uh, kicking on a bit. <laughs> uh, okay, we have got a couple the morning. Of, you have to be careful. Exactly, I would. It's, it's okay. It's uh, over 18. Um, does Colback, if Colback plays, says Emmett, will he get a good reception, Mitch? Oh, give over. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Boo. Yeah, that's probably what he, yeah, that's what uh, he's going to uh, get uh, pelt, uh, isn't he? He'll get a reception of sorts, but I wouldn't call it a good one, I don't think. <laughs> That'll be a funny one. What we, yeah. we were saying on the plane, Mitchell, we over, wasn't it? Uh, we were saying the three letters B E W, like boo, like a Mac of boo. Boo, uh, boo. You know, that's, that's the sort of abuse you get, I reckon. John asked you to put a few questions in. Let's ask this one. He says, will we finish above Manchester United? Yeah. Yes. Confident. Okay. Yeah. Okay, there we go. It's a simple answer to a simple question. Barry Hogan and Andrew Malloy both talking financial fair play. So let's uh, combine the two questions, Mitch. Uh, Barry says, Mitch, financial fair play talks about income offsetting spending. What can the club do to increase the income other than sponsorship? And Andrew Malloy says... Should the club have announced sponsorship of the training ground, as that could bring in thirty million, like Everton, and help with financial fair play? Uh, the answer to, to that is yeah, but that that would be an option, and I'm sure it's something still being looked at. Um, I get the distinct impression that staggering the way they're bringing some of these things in, so I don't know if, how much of that is planned, and how much of it is a result of not being able to get funny eighty eight off the shirt um, for this season, but for next. You know, and that's maybe changed some of the way they want to stagger some of bringing some of that in. Um, if you look at how clubs make their income these days, there is a to a degree increase in match day income helps, but not that much. The biggest source of income now is is broadcast, and then after that, it's other sponsorship and commercial de- deals, and that's why we've got this disparity where we got left behind. If you look at us. Um, Pre Ashley, our sort of uh, peers, as it were, were probably Man City and and Tottenham. And if you look at what they've done commercially during that time, and our new CEO was involved very heavily with Spurs doing this because he was that club secretary, I think, at the time. Um, They grew their commercial income exponentially where we stood still. And we all know in football, if you stand still, you're actually going backwards. And that's the challenge we've got. The positives of not being left with a load of debt and the positives of being a, um, a club holding assets and not owing many people money um, was fantastic from an FFP point of view. The little jiggle that they've made was totally with us in mind um, to, to stop us just coming in and going for it. I've seen some very interesting and innovative ideas that people have chucked out on social media about, well, could we do this and could we do that? And the answer is, to most of them is no, because you would actually be dri- driving a coach and a horses right through the centre of the FFP rules and the way they work it. Um, but sure as eggs is eggs, they'll be, they'll be working on deals like, for example, that noon deal. deal. That noon patch on the, on the sleeve is bringing in as much now 
is phone 88 is on the front. And so when we do switch from phone 88, there's our ability to go back to the uh, APL and say, right, look, in terms of rating this deal and how much we can take in, well, look what we're getting for the sleeve. And so I think um, there's lots of things like that. Training ground sponsorship has, has got to be looked at. Um, there's got to be loads of different ways that you can pinch from the various models that people use to gain more of that commercial income. And looking at Man City, looking at Tottenham, it, it, it's the kind of things like that that we need to look at. Um, because we can do that also, though, unlike Tottenham, without the leverage debt hanging on it all. And that does make a big difference in the long run. It's just the way the rules have been tweaked. It's going to take us that little bit longer to take advantage of that. Yeah, it's the thing, isn't it, Stu, that gets people a little bit confused, the whole financial fair play. They look down the road, they see people like Manchester City spending millions of pounds a go, well, how can they do that when we can't do that? But the, the difference is the turnover, the income that Manchester City have been making over the last few years, and that is the difference between them and us. That, that's exactly it. The last 15 years, they've been generating a lot more money than we have, so it gives them more leeway to spend. But the argument against that is because... Ashley was so, shall we say, prudent or frugal with, uh, with the purse strings, then we don't have the debt. Yes, that works in our favour, but there's something that's, that people need to be keep reminded of. The, the PIF or an investment fund and the us to make money, they haven't bought it as some fancy toy that's like a Bramvich did for, for Chelsea. So they do need to make a sustainable model, but there's so much options where they can't. But the thing that Mitch touched on there was this, the funny 88. It's illegal to gamble uh, in, well, in, in Islam. So it's specifically Saudi. You, you can't be advertising it because I was meant to get a couple of shirts for people, as you know, working over there. And I can't get it with that on. So I'm going to have to order it off noon and maybe get it for next Ramadan for them or something by the time it gets all delivered with the Kastori mess up. But, uh, there's, there's things like that. They could sponsor the training ground. They could sponsor a new build of a build of a training ground. You know, something like the Aramco Arena. Uh, there's there's a stand, and I, I know I've talked about this before uh, on Jolly See How Jolly's there. The the East Stand, where it's got Newcastle United on it. Would anyone be too upset if that was like Aramco stand? You know, and it brought in fifty million pounds because where the cameras are, it's staring straight at that. And they can justify it with, look how much money they're spending on uh, motor racing. No one bats an eyelid, you know, but, but because it's Newcastle, they want to cause a problem. Now, they can justify it because it'll, it'll generate more global awareness because the Premier League is a global brand. brand. They can't have it both ways. They can't say they're one of the leading sporting brands in the world, the Premier League, and then say you can't give big money for advertising because you're not a bigger club yet. So, again, I think if they, if they just went in now and said, right, we'll give you this, we'll give you that, there'll be people looking to pick it apart. And there's something I discussed with Mitch and George on Thursday. Sometimes the, our new board, they're, they're being too careful. They're being ultra careful of not rocking the boat. They want to do it professionally. They want to do it properly. Um, but they will get it right. And they are getting everything right so far. You know what I mean? So, if... Let's just say, right, see this year, where's the same? The, the Noon Badge, it was seven and a half million they paid for it. If they could have just said, right, I'll get someone in for five, but they've got the right one, which then that then goes to this, doesn't it? The the 48 eight next season. And if we're in Europe, they you know if we qualify even for the European Conference League, then fantastic. It justifies more expenditure. And they can't then say what's right and what's wrong in the Middle East. They can't say this wouldn't generate that much money. This wouldn't generate because it's it's massively washed over here. And for anyone who just dis- well over there because I'm in Newcastle, I mean, for anyone who disputes the, uh, the 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 say that being sports have, look at how much hassle the cause they're about to take over in the first place. If the money wasn't important, if the exposure, the expenditure, if the advertising wasn't important, then why did they kick up such a fuss? Uh, I know there's an obvious answer to that because they go down the stealing route and stuff like that, but the the, there's money there, so they could justify getting. I'll just use Aramco because it's a brand that everyone will know. Aramco on the front of the shirt, okay, just because Man City pay that, or Liverpool get paid that, or West Ham get paid this. This is what they believe that is to Newcastle because we're, we're predominantly Saudi owned. 
you know, there's a lot of back scratching going on, but it also it, it favours, it curries favours in other deals as well, as Mitch has explained in the past, because he was the first one that I know of that said that the, the first sponsor would come outside of Saudi. Uh, and the noon one it proves that with it the, with the being Dubai based. So that there's plenty of ways they can make money, but I think if we wait till next year, that's when you'll see the, the big, big money coming in. Uh, I'm sure there'll be one or two more additions as and when they can, when they feel like that's the maximum and get out of it. But they could have bought Fun 88 out and, and got someone to pay 15 million to get on the front of the shirt. But if you wait another year, you could get 30 million a year and even possibly higher. So why not wait? They can afford to do it. But our concern is what's on the pitch. That's, that's what we want, you know, and, and these people want as, as much as we do. And it, it fits their model and their model will only work the way they want it to do with a successfully Newcastle United. So let them let them do what they're doing. Yeah, let them do what they're doing. A big shout out to our sponsors. Uh, as always, uh, with uh, them, uh, we can uh, help grow the channel. Thanks to Skips and Bins. Telephone 0800 2545 253. Email inquiries at skipsandbins.com. Website www.skipsandbins.com. Easy contract free and pays you go waste collection. Thanks to Darren Baldwin Funerals. You can find them at 304 Old Durham Road, Gateshead. Telephone 0191 478 2730. Email Darren at Darren Baldwin's funerals.co.uk and jump onto the website www.darrenbaldwinfunerals.co.uk. Uh, thanks to Garden of Healing Dispensary, CBD Hemp and Cannabinoid Specialists, www.thgohd.com. And thanks to Mr. Vicky's Sources, handmade in Cumbria. You can find the guys at mrvickies.co.uk or by phone in 01768 210102. Thanks to Away Day Clothing. And thanks to Media Arts for all the help with the video side of things. Thanks to qtechshop.co.uk, the makers of pool tables and snooker tables in Walls and Newcastle, and the guys who run our website, nufcmatters.com. If you're a first-time viewer and you want to subscribe, hit the NUFC Matters logo in the bottom right-hand corner and you can subscribe for free. We do seven shows a week. Hit the thumb up under the video to like it. Once you come off the show, I know people struggle on their iPad, uh, then you can do it after the show by coming back to the video and just clicking the thumb up. Click share to share to your social media, such as Twitter and Facebook. Stick it in some Newcastle United groups you might be members of. Uh, it helps the channel grow. Please also take a look at us on iTunes, Spotify, uh, Podbean, and other podcast providers if you're out and about. And uh, they usually go up 24 hours after the show has been updated. And if you want to help... Uh, the show as well you can click join or you can go to the website nufcmatters.com and click membership or use your smartphone on this qr code it will take you straight there if you use that option you can get a cup a pen a scarf a membership card and entry into the monthly draw we also send out free stickers to those of you who subscribe simply email john at nufcmatters.com and he will post you one out don't forget the food bank uh, we support the guys on this show. Uh, we'll be outside uh, St. James's Park, over the road from Shearer's today, collecting as usual. If you're not at the game, uh, then please make a virtual donation to the food bank. You can do that 365 days a year at nufcfansfoodbank.co.uk. Uh, two tickets left for the Frank Clark talk-in. Do not miss out on this. Time Out Surf Cafe, uh, 5th of December, and uh, Frank Clark with Gibbo. Two tickets left. Uh, if you're going to uh, go to that, then uh, you need to act fast. And uh, the Peter Beardsley Soccer School continues. Info at peterbeardsleysoccerschool.com if you want your kids to be trained by a Newcastle United legend. And don't forget, uh, pre-match tokens are the order of the day. Uh, I think a few of the lads are going to be up at the Black and White Bull, formerly the Black Bull on Barrack Road. John Anderson and John Gibson there from 12 o'clock today. And I will be at the Dog and Parrot with Superback from 12 o'clock today. Uh, Malcolm does a pre-match and a post-match at the Dog and Parrot. So get yourself along nice and early. Kids are welcome at both bars. And uh, that concludes the adverts. Five minutes left, lads. Um, let's look at the transfer window because it's still open, Mitch. And a question that was asked a little bit earlier from Barry Hogan is, which striker would Mitch and Stu sign now? Obviously, lots of things have happened over the last co uh, course of the last week. A couple of the options have been removed. Some have moved on. Um, out of people who are available, 
who would you uh, uh, and Stu sign? Mitch, you first. Well, I've said it before, and I'll stick with my answer. The person I see who compliments Wood and Wilson, who knew, who would give us a different option, but could also play alongside both if needed be, and could even play in a three with all three of them, would be Calvert Lewin. Yeah, and was he injured now? He is. He's picked up a what quote unquote freak injury. I don't know if he went over a stiletto on the catwalk or something like that. <laughs> so some sort of uh, he's, he's picked up some sort of freak injury of one form or another. Um, and certainly, um, yeah, that might have been me. Uh, <laughs> uh, There's the certainly, for me, he, he would bring that sort of mix that we need. We need somebody. We either need a younger understudy to Callum Wilson or we need a finished product who offers something different to Wilson and Wood. And that's why I go down Calvert-Lewin route. The, the club haven't confirmed. I'm just checking the Everton website because that's the best place to go. And they are still assessing, mm. they're still assessing the knee injury. Um, the papers picked up on it two days ago, though. They seem to suggest that it could be three months. So, uh, you know, the, the quote from Frank Lampard is, um, they are hoping it's not long term, but no real news yet. But I, I agree. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. It's not worse than when you go over on your ankle on a platform, you know. <laughs> Stu, Calvert-Lewin? Not for me, no. Uh, I don't think he's better than Wilson. And this is like one of these debates that will rage on until we actually sign someone. Uh, I believe, <clears throat> anyhow, has utmost faith in Callum Wilson. And, and I think he, if he stays injury-free, which is the biggest problem, uh, I've actually put a bet on him at 50-1 to 1, uh, each way to be top scorer in the Premier League. So there's five places. I think he can score 20 goals with a free run and he's making changes to his personal life to help him do that, like fitness-wise, travelling-wise, uh, moving the family up and everything else. So I, I really don't think we'll buy a, a striker that, that's, that will replace Callum Wilson. So uh, in that, if you look at all everything that we've been linked with, it seems to be a young promising player with potential that they want in to, to be the third player and then that person comes in and give it two years when Wilson's pace starts to wane then there's the, the passing of the number nine shirt you know someone who's learnt the trade learnt about the club and can play intermittently um, give Wilson two more years at it and then bring the new lad in whoever that may be but I still think we're, when we're going to add it'll be in, in midfield or on the wing and you know the, the, the names that come up more often than not are to, for me are Tillemans and Paquetta uh, and I know some of the players are expecting Paquetta to come in as well so that might just be because they would like him there but like you said will, will, he, will, he, will he come? I don't know is it a smoke screen with the, the Madison? No, if they wanted Madison and they would have got Madison and they might still go back in for Madison um, up front I, I really do, I, I couldn't like to say I, I mentioned Shea Adams as a curveball a few weeks back didn't I yeah. and the only reason I picked him was because the style of play is is similar to Callum Wilson he's, he's not Callum Wilson he's not as good as Callum Wilson but he's, his style of play is similar so it could be a like for like replacement if Wilson was to be injured for a period of time um, and then maybe next year when we've got more a higher league position and, and we've got more to offer a big name striker, maybe that's what they'll do next season. But at the moment, the names that we've been linked with, uh, like the the Isaacs and uh, Ozymans and stuff like that, it's it's fantasy football as much as we'd like it to happen. The realist, we have to be realistic as well. And who are we going to attract? And it's only the, the to me the younger players who are going to come and say, okay, I want to be part of this project, and I understand my role will be to grow with the club over the next couple of years and my game time will increase accordingly it, that's easier to attract uh, than someone like Dominic Calvert-Lewin who's going to come in and expect to play you know and Wilson a, is a big part of that team in the squad and it and it's and I know Malcolm talked about it you can just get one and it knocks the whole symmetry off the team doesn't it one, one yeah. not, I'm not saying he's a bad apple but you know you take one person out, he starts sulking and he goes to training with that person who then becomes affected by it. And this is the balance act that, to date, Eddie House got absolutely spot on. 
So I think up front it'll be it'll be an understudy for Wilson uh, or someone young that can come and learn off him and take the shirt off him in a couple of years' time. Um, I might be wrong. I might be. Uh, it's not the first time I have been. I can't see them buying someone to replace Wilson though, and that's the thing. And I don't think he's going to change the formation to four four two because he's he's it's been tried and tested this four three three, and it, it works. It works for us. It works for the players we've got. So. Up front, I, I really don't know. I really don't know. But I can hear the clinking of glasses and the, the slamming of tills, lads. It's uh, time to close. Time to close the show. Uh, close the show and open the bar. Uh, big, big thank you to you guys for coming on. Uh, looking forward to doing this show uh, throughout the season, and uh, look forward to seeing you later. Thanks everybody in the chat. Thanks to all the moderators. Thanks for all your questions. I will be back six o'clock tomorrow night with Ben Jacobs looking back on hopefully Newcastle United's first win of the season. Until then, uh, I bid you goodbye. See you later, Mitch. See you later, Stu. Yeah, yeah see you later, Mitch.